1943, northern Tunisia. A Harvard anthropologist named Carlton Kuhn is leading a band of 50 American, French and Arab guerrillas through territory crawling with German and Italian forces. His mission is sabotage. His methods are unconventional. Among the explosives in his arsenal are devices that look exactly like mule droppings. Not approximately like mule droppings. Exactly like them. Because Kuhn had collected real samples from Rock and Roads, shipped them to London in a British diplomatic pouch, and received back what he later called perfect plastic explosive facsimiles. This is the story of how British and American intelligence turned animal waste into a weapon, how film industry craftsmen and London Zoo specimens combined to create explosive devices disguised as something so mundane, so disgusting, that no one thought to examine them closely, and how a simple idea, hiding bombs inside dung, may have achieved more through fear than through actual destruction. The problem facing Allied saboteurs in North Africa was not a lack of explosives. It was a lack of opportunity. German and Italian supply lines stretched across thousands of miles of road, feeding Rommel's Africa Corps with fuel, ammunition and reinforcements. Conventional sabotage required agents to reach railways, bridges or fuel depots, all of which were heavily guarded. Sentries watched key infrastructure around the clock. Patrols swept potential approach routes, Getting close enough to plant explosives often meant getting close enough to die. But roads were different. Roads were everywhere. Miles upon miles of unpaved track crossing empty desert and mountain passes where no patrol could maintain constant vigilance. And these roads were covered in something the enemy never thought to protect. Camels, mules, horses and donkeys moved constantly across North African and Mediterranean roads. Military convoys shared routes with civilian traffic merchant caravans, and local farmers. Animal droppings were so common that drivers barely noticed them. Tires rolled over dung dozens of times per journey. Nobody gave it a second thought. Kuhn, the Harvard anthropologist turned OSS agent, recognised this opportunity. As he noted in his 1980 memoir A North Africa Story, mule deposits were the one reliable feature found on all Moroccan roads. If you could hide an explosive inside something soldiers ignored, you could strike anywhere, at any time without warning. The Special Operations Executive, Britain's secret sabotage organisation established in July 1940, had already pioneered disguised explosives. Their most famous creation was explosive coal, fake lumps designed to detonate when shoveled into locomotive fireboxes. The results were spectacular. Boiler explosions derailed trains and destroyed locomotives from the inside. Researchers Frederick Boyce and Douglas Everett, in their authoritative technical history, SOE The Scientific Secrets Estimate that approximately three and a half tonnes of explosive coal were produced between 1941 and 1945, but coal required access to enemy fuel stores. The dung bomb eliminated even that requirement. Instead of targeting trains, it targeted vehicles. Instead of hiding in coal piles, it hid in plain sight on open roads. Development of disguised explosives fell to SOE's camouflage section operating from a converted country house hotel called The Thatched Barn in Borehamwood, Hertfordshire. This was Station 15, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel J. Elder Wills. Before the war, Wills had been an RAF veteran who flew in the First World War and later transitioned to film work as an art director. After the Second World War, he would become chief art director for Hammer Films, the studio famous for gothic horror. But during the conflict, he led up to 300 technicians recruited from the nearby Elstree Studios. These were not scientists or military engineers. They were prop makers, stage technicians and plasterers, people who knew how to make fake objects look real. They had spent years creating convincing sets for British cinema, mastering techniques to fool audiences into believing painted backdrops were distant mountains and plaster walls were ancient stone. Their expertise in theatrical deception proved perfect for creating sabotage devices that could fool the enemy at close range. The recruitment of film industry professionals was deliberate. SOE needed craftsmen who understood visual deception at an instinctive level. A scientist could design an explosive, but making that explosive look like something else entirely required artistic skill. The same eye for detail that ensured period accuracy in costume dramas now ensured that fake animal dung matched the real thing in every visible respect. Film plasterer Walter Bull exemplified this unlikely career path from cinema to sabotage. Before the war, he created sets for British productions. During the conflict, he developed casting techniques for explosive devices. After the war, he would become chief plasterer on 2001, A Space Odyssey. 
crafting the alien landscapes and futuristic sets that defined that film's visual style. His wartime work earned him a civil MBE. The same hands that would later build space stations for Stanley Kubrick first built explosive camel dung for British intelligence. The thatched barn itself had been a country house hotel before requisition. Its rural location in Hertfordshire provided cover for unusual activities. Trucks arriving with theatrical supplies attracted no suspicion. The nearby Elstree Studios offered a ready pool of skilled craftsmen who understood discretion. Many had signed the Official Secrets Act and would never speak publicly about their wartime work. According to records held at the Natural History Museum, SOE obtained sample animal droppings from London Zoo's collection. Each theatre of war required its own authentic local fauna. Camel dung for North Africa. Mule and horse droppings for Mediterranean and European operations. Cow pats for operations in rural France. Even elephant dung for potential Far East operations. A substation of Station 15 operated within the Natural History Museum itself, where craftsmen created plaster moulds capturing every detail of authentic droppings. Texture, colour, size, even the way droppings aged and dried in different climates. The goal was perfection. A fake dropping had to be indistinguishable from the real thing, even under close inspection by suspicious soldiers. Agents' lives depended on that authenticity. The casting process required multiple iterations. Fresh dung looks different from day-old dung. Dung in wet conditions differs from dung baked under desert sun. Craftsmen created variants for each scenario, ensuring that whatever an agent encountered in the field, the corresponding explosive replica would match. This attention to detail separated amateur sabotage from professional covert operations. A single, unconvincing device could compromise an entire network. Winston Churchill and King George VI both visited the Natural History Museum facility to inspect the disguised explosives on display. Six demonstration rooms showcased SOE's bizarre arsenal. The Prime Minister and the King walked past explosive coal, explosive rats, and explosive dung, examining the craftsmanship that might help win the war. A memorial plaque outside the Mammals Gallery still commemorates the SOE personnel who worked in those secret rooms. The explosive charge inside these devices consisted of Nobel 808, Britain's standard plastic explosive, a green plasticine-like substance with a distinctive almond smell developed by Nobel chemicals before the war. Station 12 at Aston House had pioneered its use for sabotage applications. The detonation mechanism used SOE-designed pressure switches that would trigger when a vehicle tyre rolled over the device, collapsing a spring-loaded striker onto a percussion cap. The result was a blast designed to destroy tyres and disable vehicles. The pressure threshold was carefully calibrated. It had to be heavy enough that footsteps would not trigger detonation. Agents placing the devices needed to walk away safely. Animals crossing roads could not set off explosions that would reveal the program's existence, but the threshold had to be light enough that vehicle tyres would reliably trigger the switch. As early as June 1940, according to historian Malcolm Atkins' research in National Archives documents, British Section D established a joint store in Alexandria, Egypt containing six tons of what operatives called toys, including plastic explosives designed to look like camel droppings. This predates American involvement in the war by 18 months, confirming the British origin of the concept. Now, before we see how this performed in the field, if you are enjoying this deep dive into British ingenuity, hit subscribe. It takes a second, costs nothing, and helps the channel grow. Right, back to the dung. The most detailed operational account comes from Carlton Kuhn himself. In his memoir, he describes collecting real mule droppings from Moroccan roads, shipping specimens to London via British diplomatic pouch, and receiving back the manufactured explosive replicas. Kuhn specifically corrected a Time magazine report that had erroneously described camel dung. They were mule droppings, he emphasised. He called the device the mule's revenge on the motor vehicle. Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Rick Atkinson describes Kuhn's activities in an army at dawn, his account of the North African campaign. Kuhn led a band of 50 desperados, blew up a railroad bridge, harassed the local Italian garrison, and scattered mule turds by the bushel. This was guerrilla warfare at its most unconventional, conducted by an academic who spoke fluent Arabic and understood the terrain better than most military officers. According to Kuhn's own accounting of his booby trap operations, his devices claimed only two casualties total, one Arab and one cow. No confirmed vehicle destruction counts appear in available sources. No German or Italian after-action reports mentioning losses to disguised dung explosives have been located in accessible archives. 
This presents a paradox that gets to the heart of what made these weapons effective. The devices appear to have caused minimal direct casualties, but that may not have been the point. Legend has it that German tank drivers in North Africa believed driving over camel dung brought good luck. The story goes that this superstition spread throughout the Africa Corps, and that Allied intelligence discovered this habit and exploited it by planting explosive dung along routes where German vehicles passed. According to the tale, once Germans realised dung could explode, they stopped driving over fresh droppings, but continued to drive over dung that already showed tyre tracks, reasoning that previously run over dung must be safe. The British then supposedly created fake dung, with tyre track impressions pre-moulded into the casing. This counter and counter counter narrative has circulated widely in military trivia. However, despite extensive searching, no primary source documentation for this story has been located. No Africa Corps veteran memoirs, no German military documents, no academic histories cite evidence for this superstition or the escalating countermeasures. The story should be understood as popular legend rather than documented fact. What is documented is the psychological principle behind disguised weapons. SOE understood that fear could achieve more than destruction. The most revealing insight comes from their parallel operation using explosive rats. When a shipment of rat carcasses stuffed with plastic explosive was intercepted by Germans before deployment SOE files recorded that the trouble caused to them was a much greater success than if the rats had actually been used. The Germans exhibited the intercepted rats at military schools and conducted extensive searches across the continent a massive waste of resources chasing devices that were never actually distributed. The explosive rats were never deployed operationally. The first shipment was intercepted, and the program's value shifted entirely to psychological disruption. Approximately 100 were produced, but none reached their intended targets. Yet German security forces spent countless hours searching for devices that did not exist in the field. The same principle applied to dung bombs. Once an enemy becomes aware that everyday objects might explode, the psychological burden multiplies far beyond actual casualties. Every pile of dung on every road becomes a potential threat. Time and resources are wasted on inspection and avoidance. Even if few vehicles are destroyed, operational tempo suffers as convoys slow and paranoia spreads. The Africa Corps already faced severe hardships. Dysentery outbreaks killed soldiers by the hundreds. Supply shortages left units without adequate food, water and ammunition. The relentless desert heat broke down men and machines alike, adding the psychological burden of explosive dung, whether that threat was real or merely perceived, compounded physical misery with mental strain. German sabotage services developed their own disguised explosives during the conflict. Declassified MI5 files document an arsenal including explosive tins of plums and peas, throat lozenges, shaving brushes, batteries, coal, stuffed dogs, and most notoriously, a chocolate bar bomb intended to assassinate the royal family, but dung appears nowhere in German records. This was a uniquely British and American innovation. The American OSS developed similar devices after entering the war. Their research and development branch under Stanley Lovell created Black Joe explosive coal with camouflage kits for matching local coal types, mule dung explosives documented alongside the coal, and Aunt Jemima explosive flour that could actually be baked into bread and eaten without harm until detonated. But the original concepts came from British SOE, with the thatched barn craftsmen providing the manufacturing expertise. Among British disguised explosives, the dung variants sat alongside several other innovations. Explosive coal saw verified production and likely operational deployment. Explosive rats achieved psychological success without ever being used. Explosive logs targeted wood-burning facilities. Explosive fruit tins, bicycle pumps, and stone lanterns rounded out the catalogue. For Far East operations, craftsmen even produced explosive Balinese wood carvings to be sold to Japanese troops by undercover agents. The full range appeared in SOE's classified descriptive catalogue of special devices and supplies, a document listing everything from explosive coal to incendiary cigarettes. This catalogue, dating from 1944 and 45, served as a menu of options for agents planning sabotage operations. National Archives files document the SOE camouflage section's work. File HS 101, bracket 99, close bracket, holds a photograph album with 122 images of Station 15B at the Natural History Museum. These records confirm the program's existence and scope, even if operational deployment remains difficult to verify for specific devices. The legacy of disguised explosives extends beyond the Second World War. 
the principle of hiding weapons inside objects people ignore has appeared in every subsequent conflict. Improvised explosive devices in Iraq and Afghanistan often employed similar psychological tactics, forcing troops to view every piece of roadside debris as a potential threat. The coalition forces who faced those threats were experiencing what Allied planners hoped German drivers would feel decades earlier. Consider what the explosive dung bomb achieved with minimal resources. Plaster, plastic explosive, a pressure switch, and samples from London Zoo. No advanced technology, no precision manufacturing, just theatrical skill applied to warfare. Film craftsmen from Elstree Studios had created something that could make an entire army second-guess the mundane. Kuhn's operations in North Africa demonstrate what unconventional thinking could accomplish. A Harvard anthropologist who understood local culture and terrain, armed with explosive mule droppings manufactured in London, caused disruption far beyond what conventional forces might expect from 50 guerrillas. He blew up a railroad bridge. He harassed Italian garrisons. He scattered his strange weapons across Moroccan roads. The confirmed casualties were minimal, one Arab and one cow. But measuring success by body count misses the point. These were weapons of doubt. Weapons designed to make the enemy afraid of the ordinary. To transform roads from supply routes into minefields of uncertainty. The dung bomb was disgusting. That was precisely the point. Bomb disposal units trained to handle high explosives and complex mechanisms would naturally hesitate before examining suspected animal waste. The British had created a weapon so revolting that avoidance became the natural response. That is British engineering excellence. Not always elegant, not always conventional, but effective when it mattered most. From London zoo specimens to Moroccan roads, from film studio craftsmen to guerrilla warfare, the explosive dung bomb represents innovation under pressure. The weapons legend may have grown beyond its documented achievements. The stories about German superstitions and escalating countermeasures make for compelling narrative, but lack archival support. What remains verified is remarkable enough. British craftsmen studied zoo specimens to create theatrical props filled with military explosives, and American anthropologists scattered those props across North African roads. The devices caused minimal confirmed casualties, but introduced a new variable into enemy calculations. Every pile of dung on every road became a question. Is it real, or is it a bomb? That question alone, repeated thousands of times across a theatre of war, represented victory of a kind. Not victory measured in bodies or destroyed vehicles. Victory measured in doubt, delay, and psychological burden. The principle remains as relevant today as it was in 1943. The most effective hidden weapon is often the one disguised as something too ordinary or too disgusting to warrant investigation.